Hello and welcome to all of our attendees. Thank you for joining us for this panel presented by Folk Alliance International for Folk Unlocked. My name is Amy Reitnauer Jacobs and I am the board president for Folk Alliance International and the executive director and co-founder of the Bluegrass Situation. To begin, we recognize the complexity and privilege of gathering online today by sharing a digital land acknowledgement written by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show in Ontario and adapted for this webinar. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let us take a moment to acknowledge the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not readily available in many indigenous and marginalized communities. We invite you to join in acknowledging our shared responsibility to make good of this time, and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and active allyship. I myself am grateful to join you from Los Angeles, California, the traditional territories of the Keech, Tongva, and Chumash people. We hope that you'll share your thoughts and observations in the Folk Unlock chat box today. This panel will be available for viewing for the remainder of the conference once it is aired at its scheduled time. In June 2020, FAI hosted a webinar entitled Steering the Ship Through the Storm to talk about the decisions the leaders of the Americana Music Association, the Blues Foundation, Global Fest, the International Bluegrass Music Association, or IBMA for short, and Folk Alliance International were making to protect their organizations and support their members. It was a candid conversation about fiscal responsibility, concepts of health and safety, and living up to principles of social justice. We are reconvening those leaders of the organizations to talk about what's changed, what's new, and how they see their roles in our community now. One change since the initial session was re the retirement of the Blues Foundation CEO, Barbara Newman. So today we extend a special welcome to their new CEO, Patty Wilson Aiden. If you'd like to review the original session, we will put a link to it in the chat now so you can save it and watch it later. For this follow-up conversation six months later, please welcome back our moderator from NPR, Ann Powers. Well, here I am. <laughs> First snafu, technical snafu of our, our panel and, uh, and emblematic of this time we're living at in. Uh, we are all still learning, although most of us have mastered to some extent our virtual lives. And that's one thing we're going to talk about. That's a central concern of this uh, conversation today. Thanks to everyone who has uh, joined us today. Thanks so much to Folk Alliance for bringing us together to have this crucial conversation about sustaining community uh, in a time like no other. I. Um, I was really heartened by the depth and honesty of the conversation we had some months ago. Uh, we really focused on accountability and on, on the challenges that the uh, reckoning uh, we have all been involved in this year uh, in confronting racism, uh, oppression, all of the all of the many challenges and 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 roadblocks and and struggles that, that we go through in, in creating an equitable and fruitful uh, world for all of us to live in. At the same time, we also have been confronted with this ongoing pandemic. The pandemic's challenges are intertwined with the challenges posed by Black Lives Matter and the social justice movements um, that are leading us today. And, and equally intertwined, with the political environment that we are all working to uh, make the best for all of us, but which sometimes has, I think this year more than ever, uh, uh, felt out of our individual control. So as we move forward in this conversation, we are dedicated to having an intersectional conversation uh, where we are always mindful of how all of these issues, logistics, um, artistic ideals, community building, political work are all intertwined. And I value all of you for doing that work. So with no further ado, 
I, I would love to welcome our panel. You know, we are first going to talk about community event making. Each of your organizations have held major events and created relief efforts to serve your members during this time. Uh, I've been lucky enough to attend many of these events and they've been uh, models for moving forward in the future, perhaps even beyond the pandemic, which would be great to talk about as we realize the, the uh, challenges of access that have always been at issue for our communities. And uh, maybe we've learned some lessons from the pandemic will carry forward once we all have that shot in our arm, those shots in our arm. So I'm curious to hear more about the process by which each of you uh, have come to create new ways of, of building a sustaining community. As I introduce you each, I am, will pose a question along these lines. And now, <laughs> so my first question is gonna to go to Patty Aiden, and, and, and uh, I'm so excited to have you here, uh, Patty. We just got to know each other a little bit on the phone recently, and the Blues Foundation is such an important uh, part of American music community for you and I, uh, as Tennessee residents, such an important uh, organization both preserving the culture of the South and uh, connecting its histories to younger generations as well as we move into the 21st century. Um, the Blues Foundation was one of the first to face the challenge of having a virtual event. In uh, May, on May 3rd, the Blues Music Awards happened online and you at that time were uh, at the African American Museum in Philadelphia, where you are facing your own uh, challenges and figuring out how a museum, a virtual, a different kind of uh, community space, could become virtual. So, I want to, I want to, you know, say that you can talk to us from your perspective as, uh, as you know, a museum uh, person, or and now as someone running a music foundation. Um, what role do you think virtual events have come to play in community building and sustaining? And particularly, how have you worked to know your audiences and the particular needs of your audiences, of your community members, how they can access virtual events, you know, how they can come together virtually, and how sometimes that, that may uh, pose particular challenges? Sure. Well, thank you for welcoming me. I am very pleased to be part of this convening. Uh, and while I bring the perspective of my experience with the African American Museum, I'm gonna really focus on the work that we're doing at the Blues Foundation because the Blues Foundation is really um, wrestling with this idea of how do we uh, present our programs virtually but also, as you've alluded to, how do we ensure that as we present those programs, we are being true to our mission and we are engaging uh, with our constituency in a real meaningful and substantive way? Um, I think we all agree that uh, virtual programming has its advantages. It allows us to go beyond our physical boundaries. So whereas before you might have been restricted to a room of 100 or a room of 1500, uh, your audience uh, across the internet is boundless, could be boundless. So what we have enjoyed is the opportunity to expand our audience, to include different people, to have a, uh, a, a, a different kind of energy uh, with our virtual programming. Our Blues Music Awards were virtual in May, 2020. They will be virtual once again in 2021. Our International Blues Challenge will also be a virtual experience. And we're trying to experiment there where we will um, use social media. Um, rather than a set program, we are going to engage in a social media campaign over the course of several months uh, to engage uh, and pay tribute to our International Blues Challenge. What we have learned is that uh, some of the things that are tried and true within the nonprofit cultural community 
um, will have to be transformed virtually. Um, the cadence of programming has to be different. We can't take it for granted that our audience is going to stick with us. So we have to grab them uh, and, and hold their attention from the very beginning. Uh, we have to um, look at um, what the programming uh, is about. What we found at the uh, Blues Foundation is that it's very helpful for us to know our audience in a more intimate way. So we have uh, adopted uh, the practice of regularly surveying our audience. And those surveys have been very helpful because they've told us um, some things that we didn't anticipate. We were taking some things for granted. Um, you know, this whole challenge of monetizing events, um, virtual events, we had anticipated a certain price point and we found that there wasn't the appetite for that price point. Uh, we have found that uh, our audience uh, is has a limited appetite actually for longer programs. They are more interested in shorter programs. So we are continuing to learn and refine our programming based upon the feedback that we're getting from our audiences. One thing that we're learning too is that as you expand with virtual programming, you're gonna have different voices in the room and voices that are, have not necessarily been uh, traditional voices. That adds a new dynamic to the conversation. And then also we've learned that we may have to take, and I actually will change that to from May to we will certainly have to take steps to ensure that we are inclusive. We understand that the blues community includes some marginalized uh, communities that are not necessarily um, digitally connected. So we have to address that digital divide, especially as we are looking at our older African-American artists um, we have to facilitate their participation, their connection, because certainly their voice uh, is absolutely critical to have an authentic conversation about the blues. Eloquently said, Patty, thank you so much. Uh, I want to ask you a specific question as a follow up um, about uh, the position of the blues historically in American culture, particularly, and then in world culture as well. And, and how uh, perhaps uh, awareness of the, of the blues is the role of the blues in, um, in African-American resistance is heightened during this time uh, of you know, such strong social justice movements. And I wanna pair that question with, with uh, the, I'm doing a little uh, alchemy here, <laughs> I hope, a little blues alchemy. Because I think about that, like, the social meaning of the blues, the political meaning of the blues. Then I also think about um, the thingness of the blues, the aura of the blues. And I know as a museum, uh, as a as a museum curator, you've thought about aura and and the importance of being in a room with objects, or in the case of music, being in the room with musicians. And I think a lot of the mythos of the blues has had to do with the connection between musicians and the audience. So as we consider uh, what what the relationship between blues's audience in the 21st century. Um, let's let's just be honest. A lot of older white folks love the blues, right? And maybe that's like an essence of of Blues Foundation's community. Um, that a lot of the performers as African Americans, you know as that relationship is reassessed, I think, in light of social justice movements. And then at the same time, as you move to virtual space, I wonder how you're thinking about how the connection between artists and audiences may need to change as we move forward. That's a packed question. There are a lot of things in there. <laughs> I know, I guess we should have a, a seminar on it. <laughs> so let's go back to that question about origins and how um, blues music um, retains its relevance and actually uh, is even more relevant today than it might have been perceived some years ago. Blues music um, has always been message music. It was born of the oppression experienced by African-Americans uh, 
and you can actually track African American uh, 19th and 20th century history with the blues from Reconstruction through Jim Crow to through the Great Migration. You hear blues music in all of those instances. And while so many people connect blues music with um, trial and heartache and hardship, there is a thread in blues music, a consistent thread in blues music about defiance, about self-determination, uh, about willful uh, self-determination. So those are, uh, messages are very empowering and I think uh, underscore the relevance of the blues and the blues contribution to other types of music, especially African-American music. There is a uh, tension in uh, the blues community in recognizing that authentic history uh, with some of its audience right now. And so as we want to lift up that authentic history, as we want to ensure that the voices of those creators uh, are not only preserved but amplified, we have to, I believe, uh, talk more about the historical context of the music. So while the music has resonance, its history adds dimension and understanding to the music. And I don't think you can separate one from the other. That is a challenge for some of our members in that our members, as you said, uh, tend to skew older. They tend to be older white men and they, um, are not necessarily steeped in that history uh, and certainly um, have some concerns about efforts to sort of push the forward, the, the story forward and connect a through thread to some of the social justice issues that we're experiencing right now. Um, so for us, uh, making sure that we are very um, purposeful and orchestrating some conversations uh, is something that uh, I hope to bring to the Blues Foundation. Just being who I am as an African-American woman, uh, my experience in uh, the kind of programming, I always embrace the idea of being um, a comfortable place for uncomfortable conversations and really delving into those uncomfortable conversations. Um, I think that's what I'm there to do at the Blues Foundation. And I'm very excited about working with some allies, uh, not only at the foundation, but you know, uh, amongst the panelists here and others to really delve into some of those things. Beautiful. Thank you. I know I put you a little on the spot, but the, uh, you did. <laughs> I'm very excited about this, uh, about the future direction of the foundation. So uh, thank you so much for that. And now we're going to turn to Jed Hilly, uh, executive director of Americana Music Association. Um, Jed, you were the next to uh, hold an event in September, the Thriving Roots Conference, which uh, was, I don't want to say a substitute. It was its own living entity uh, serving uh, Americana community in light of the impossibility of holding uh, Americana Fest, which uh, takes over Nashville usually in September. Y you had to figure out how to make this conference online, um, choose a platform, name the event, invite participation, get the word out. You also chose to do not hold an uh, awards ceremony in person. And I know a lot of thought went into that choice. You, 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 uh, bestowed the awards virtually as well. Um, you're also doing all of this at a moment when um, Americana has been challenged to uh, confront its own need for redefinition, something that's been happening for a while. Uh, but really, uh, after our summer of, of, of protest and, and, and raised consciousness, uh, the imperative to do this was, was more more felt than ever before. Um, your event, you know, combined uh, well-known speakers and artists with uh, a lot of community conversation, um, musical uh, showcases, uh, 
you know, were also interspersed with that. And, and, and to my mind, one of the great things about Thriving Roots was the way that what was happening in the conversation, uh, the, the discussion around what Americana means was reflected in and extended in the musical events. I think about the Mavericks, for example, uh, and they're amazing uh, yeah. in Spanish. Yeah. So, so how did your board and staff prioritize and figure these things out and determine what to focus your attention and resources on? I, I, I'd love to say that uh, uh, it, there were lots of strokes of genius uh, among many of our board members and, and team members, but the truth is that it, it was a very organic, oh my God, what do we do next type of thing. Um, there's a lot of conversation at the board level to address we had built this brand called Americana Fest, which had drawn 25 to 30,000 people a year for the last several years to, to Nashville. And how could we not use that brand to draw people to our virtual event? Um, it was hard to make the decisions. It was heartbreaking uh, for us. I think it was heartbreaking for everybody on this panel who uh, there's no substitute for the community gathering that we have in 70 something clubs, restaurants, uh, backyards and parking lots that, that Americana Fest has become uh, for the week. There's no substitute um, for the feeling of being in the Ryman with Buddy Miller and, and, and the band and, and the magic that has been um, uh, the Americana award show. Um, but it really was a, it, it was like one thing fell in, into another. We had started a foundation. We didn't know what the rollout was going to be for the foundation as, you know, as a charitable and educational uh, uh, operation and separate business entity from the association. That is a, a 501c6. It's basically a trade association and it produces Americana Fest. Um, and then to be truthful, uh, Amy um, uh, Jacobs had reached out to us and asked us if we wanted to participate in supporting her and Ed Helms Whiskey Sour Happy Hour. And uh, being that the foundation was a charitable uh, organization, we could receive the money, distribute the money uh, to Music Cares and to direct relief for PPE. And it just instantaneously, this organic a uh, partnership, thanks to Amy and Ed's ask for us to be involved. Um, you know, we sent out all the, the tax deductible letters to all the people who contributed money to the event. And, and that was just the first realization of, oh, it looks like the foundation could be more functional this year um, in, in ways we hadn't anticipated. Uh, when we realized that we, we, you know, the heartbreaking realization that we can't all get together and, and be in the various clubs uh, is just going to be too dangerous in September. That kind of hit us in May. We still thought that we might be able to do something. We held out on the award show until September um, when, as you may recall, things just started to go crazy and there was no way we couldn't dare take the chance of putting anybody in the rhyme in and and gathering in, in that way. Um, but we created Thriving Roots and we chose not to brand through Americana Fest. Um, we chose to create an entirely new event. And one of the, 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 the first two uh, conversations about the content of what Thriving Roots would be, the, the first came from from Jackson Brown before Thriving Roots was a thing, or was uh, uh, e w you know was even uh, before any planning had begun, Jackson Brown had wanted to do an oral history um, uh, for the foundation, and and proposed having a conversation with Mavis Staples. So that was a that was perfect. And then the second conversation we we called Roseanne Cash, and we had a Zoom call and we said, what would you like to do? And we, we had, a, you know, the ask went out to her and she said, give me a day. And then we set up a Zoom call 24 or 48 hours later. 
And she said, I want to do a history of protest music. And I want to, I want to get Rye Cooter and Bonnie Raitt and uh, uh, Alice Randall and Angela Davis to be a part of that call. So I, I use those two examples um, as, you know, as starting the process of self-reflection um, for the association. It was almost like, I mean, we had that initiative. We knew we had to take a harder look at ourselves and how we chose to do it. Turned out to be really fascinating. A great majority of the panels um, were uh, conceived and created by the artists, the two that I just mentioned. Bob Weir wanted to participate and he wanted to uh, uh, talk to uh, Otile Berwick and, and uh, about African-American musicians' influence on the music of the Grateful Dead. Uh, Taj Mahal wanted to have a conversation um, about the power of music and asked you, Anne, and Rhiannon Giddens to be part of that conversation, which was, you know, fantastic. We were able to get Taj in, outside of San Francisco, and you were in Nashville, and Rhiannon was in Ireland, and all the time changes. We were able to make that happen. Uh, we were able to reach out to uh, other uh, folks. Marcus Dowling um, led a panel on uh, uh, community leadership for black equity in Americana. We didn't do that. We, we, we accept that I accept that I don't know what I don't know. And the, the greatest thing and asset I think I'm privileged to be part of is the community of the Americana Music Association. They curated this event with very little direction as if they knew, we all knew what needed to be done and what needed to be talked about. I love, uh, I love you saying, I accepted that I don't know what I don't know. That's such an important, uh, that's such an important realization for every leader to continually make. Thank you, thank you so much, Jed. The next uh, event in our, uh, in our year of virtual magic came from the IBMA. And we have Paul Schiminger here to talk about that. And I, I feel so happy and privileged. And, and I will just quickly note, Paul, uh, we're lucky to have you as you move into retirement next year. So, so thank you for making this one of your, uh, your exit strategies or <laughs> your, your victory laps. Let's call it a victory lap. <laughs> I, I thank you for that. And congratulations on retirement. Um, IBMA's event was at the end of September, uh, a week or so after Americana Fest, and you had just gone through a rebrand, um, and you kept World of Bluegrass as a name for your virtual event. I think that rebranding is uh, actually reflects some some deep thinking that you have done, similar to what uh, Jed and Americana have has done in terms of like what is bluegrass? How can we um, celebrate the the diversity and the wider definition of bluegrass that in the 21st century, I think is, is becoming so central to understanding uh, the genre. Um, you have a longstanding relationship with the city of Raleigh. And since your conference usually culminates in a huge public street festival, I mean, obviously that couldn't happen. How did you navigate what to do, uh, you know, especially uh, balancing longtime partnerships, sponsorships, a relationship with the city um, and with your community as you had this event? Thanks. Well, I appreciate and I'm honored to be on this panel. This is some esteemed colleagues, uh, peers. And, and so now, I guess now that it's uh, out here in Folk Alliance world about my retirement, I guess I have to follow through with it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so thinking about the branding just for a second, since you brought that up, I, it, we have had that brand of World of Bluegrass back in, since the late 80s. And so we went through a total rebrand to think about what message we're trying to send, what, um, what is more cohesive and consistent across the entire event, because our event is a, is a conference, it's showcasing, it's awards, and it's a festival. And World of Bluegrass still bubbled to the top for two, well, three reasons. One, our community already knew it. But it also allowed us to think about it is a world of bluegrass in terms of 
an entirety of bluegrass. It's also the world of bluegrass in terms of an international scope uh, around bluegrass. So it really checked off multiple boxes uh, when we did that. So we felt that going forward with our event with that brand was really going to be important for that consistency uh, along the way. So that was important. We never even considered uh, rebranding it because it was going virtual. We just added virtual in front of World of Bluegrass. Um, the in hearing Jed uh, talk about what he went through, I think we all uh, w were working in the dark, kind of trying to find that flashlight in the basement when suddenly the power goes out. Uh, you, you don't know where to turn. And and I, I grew up in Baltimore, and I was I was an Orioles fan, and Earl Weaver had a saying: "It's what you learn after you know it all that counts." And we were we sort of knew what our event looked like in Raleigh. We've done it many times, and we have a great staff to, that can can do this. And we have great partners in Raleigh. But this changed everything when the pandemic set in in April. No one knew what was going on. We we certainly we had hoped that in the third and fourth quarter things were going to become more normal, whatever that is now. And 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 we weren't getting much helpful information out of out of Washington either. So uh, we, we held on to the hope, uh, just like Jed talked about with his award show, that things could open back up in, in September and into, uh, into October. And we worked very closely with our Raleigh partners who were who were also trying to figure it all out. They have an entire convention bureau that you know thrives on people being there and we all wanted it to be live. There's nothing like people gathering to jam and to just just be around one another. It is a reunion of sorts at our at our event. But uh, we had to make our first decision, which was to delay sales, ticket sales, to buy us some time to continue our assessment of the situation. And our next decision was in May, June, when we decided there is just no way we're going to have this live event. And we had to, along the way, not only work with the Raleigh partners, but also the hotels because of our contracts that are are financially very large and have them finally come to the realization that we couldn't hold it live. So there was this gigantic thing that we were trying to move along the entire way. So we eventually made that decision. Everybody bought in. Okay, so now what? And it, we decided that our community needed a world of bluegrass to get together to celebrate uh, because it was such a difficult time. And, and one of the biggest challenges, and I'm sure all of my colleagues uh, here will, will probably say the same thing, is we felt that the urgent need to fulfill our mission and serve our heavily impacted community at the same time we were dealing with our own organization and the heavy financial impact that we were feeling and the concern that we had around not having a live event and what that meant to us financially. But we in June decided we needed to move forward. We took the bold step. Thankfully, we didn't know any better at the time to hold our entire week's worth of events virtually. So we went to six days and we held a conference. We had showcasing. We had two luncheon awards. We had one main award show and we had two day festival. 120 uh, uh, singular events, if you count all the performances and meetings and, and awards and what have you. And so then just like everyone else, you have to figure out what's your platform, what are you gonna charge, if you're gonna charge, et cetera. And, um, and, and so there are just so many aspects to all of those decisions. You just don't know really what the right answer is. You have to make your best guess. And then you have to rely on that community. As Jed was saying, you know, we have an incredible uh, bluegrass community that brings forth the educational components um, here. And so we had to rely on what were the important um, educational opportunities that we had. And we had to see if our community was going to dial in virtually, see if they embraced this whole thing. What were we going to do with our award show? We pivoted early. We were fortunate being here in Nashville to be able to use the Ryman Auditorium in a pre-recorded uh, event. Um, and, and it just happened to be the 75th anniversary of a monumental event in bluegrass history when Earl Scruggs joined Bill Monroe in Lester Flat. And it's kind of the launching pad for what we know bluegrass to be today. And so we could use that rhyme and stage opportunistically to, to also weave in that, uh, that as well. So we created something that was both pre-recorded 
it was all it was live it was a combination and i think what you don't know is if the rocket's going to launch until you hit the button you hit the button on that monday and when the first one works you go okay that's that's first stage now is the next one going to work etc and you just keep working from there and uh and hoping and i i i tip my hat to our staff i mean eddie huffman our director of operations who had to do all the due diligence without i mean there's no template for us to work from i mean even we couldn't even work off of jed's uh, uh experience because he was two weeks before ours you know we did get to watch the blues foundation do their award show and that was amazing what they pulled off in 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 such short order and so we were you know, just like the other organizations, we were just trying to figure it out. Thankfully, our community just reacted so positively. They they were starved to hear music. They were starved to get together and talk to one another and educate, et cetera. So it it wound it wound up uh, it wound up just being such an amazing experience for everybody. Thank you so much. I, I think uh, that IBMA's. Uh, really inspiring and one uh one thing that it, that your event reflected was the the deeply connected community of of bluegrass internationally and and here in america shanta as we turn to you uh shanta thake associate artistic director and director of artistic programs at public theater and one of the founders and creators and co-directors of global fest your community is quite different your community is a community uh defined in the moment by your event. It, it is really an, a constellation of many different communities from all around the world. And uh, you recently collaborated with NPR and NPR Music on a virtual global fest that faced these different kinds of challenges. Just as Paul was talking about how, you know, the bluegrass community was so starved to come together with people uh, they they often know well and and have spent their lives, you know, sitting in rooms with a diff global fest is a totally different thing. People from everywhere who may have never met. Uh, I think global fest uh, really changed in in a fundamental way and in a beautiful way when it became virtual. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you came to decide to do this kind of event and what you learned from it about about what Global Fest is. Thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, I think we're still learning, you know, what what um, what became clear, you know, Global Fest is a really lean and mean organization. Uh, the three co-directors, myself included, we do this as our volunteer. Um, uh, we volunteer run this organization. And uh, we do that in service of the presenting community, first and foremost, and to incentivize the touring of these musicians from around the world uh, into the center of the North American market. So it's really a very field focused event um, and brings people together, you know, across the country every year. And I'd say the first thing we did in the middle of the pandemic was that we started a weekly call, a North American presenter call. So we have weekly calls. I am often not on them. That is not part of my one of the hats I wear is my and my co-director chair. But um, but it's an incredible capture of what people are really facing in the performing arts industry. And so I think we were able to use that energy of that field. And then because we're so lean and mean, you know, COVID has been really, you know, such an example of necessity being the mother of invention. And Global Fest really runs in this uh, model all the time. And we run through our partnerships. So whether that's our visa partnership with our law firm, with our incredible partnership with our press, reps with our, you know, everybody is pitching in um, for this sort of one night event, typically. And so uh, NPR has been one of our greatest partnerships. And we've had a featured episode on All Songs Considered all, you know, every uh, year of Global Fest. And so when the when COVID happened, and as we continued, you know, we closed submissions in March. And so we had all of these artists that had submitted for one thing. 
and we still didn't know exactly how we were going to uh, be presenting. And that continued to shift as, you know, everybody is saying here so many multiple times. And then our venue that we've had it at for the last couple of years uh, shut down in the middle of the pandemic. So that no longer became an option. And we really had to think about our partnerships differently and reach out to our friends and colleagues and say, what do we think here? What is going to make this worthwhile for the artists that have submitted? Um, what's going to make this a worthwhile experience for the field? And uh, through those conversations and through our incredible conversations with Bob Boylan, uh, we were able to make this pivot to do this uh, Tiny Desk Meets Global Fest series, uh, which has ended up being just phenomenal for both the artists who, again, you know, our main concern in all of this is making sure that their investment in this time, in this process is worthwhile and that they will make an impression on sort of the hearts and minds of uh, eventually the American public. And typically the NPR Tiny Desk is at the end of that process. So we do a big global fest and our hope is that, you know, they'll get this incredible American press that will be able to drive their US tours. And this time we started out with that. So we're hoping that this incredible American press through NPR and this platform will allow them to find audiences across the country and we'll be able to bring them back uh, into our world. We also curated very specifically um, at least 50% uh, of the artists are from America. So they're from North America um, and more specifically from the United States, knowing that the touring economy will be uh, shrunk in the coming years and seeing, you know, let's try to make sure that the artists that we can commit to really can hit the ground running as soon as uh, this fog of COVID-19 lifts um, across the country. So we're hopeful. And I think what we saw in the chat as the events were happening is that this community really did gather and the barriers of travel being um, taken away, as everybody has said, Patty so eloquently, you know, really opened us up to such an incredible audience that we hope uh, we'll really see that this music isn't niche. It isn't on the sidelines. It isn't on the margins. It really does speak directly to the hearts uh, and minds of, all of us and can be transformative. So I think this is this we're very excited to see how it what it brings. Beautifully said, Shanta. And uh, I, I think that that your comments will lead beautifully into the next part of our conversation about uh, resilience and serving our communities in practical ways. But before we get there, let's talk to Angus Finnan, uh, who is our executive director at Folk Alliance International and, and really in many ways, the reason we're all here today. So Angus, Folk Alliance was one of the first, maybe the first organization to say, hey, this pandemic is a real thing. Let's take it seriously. We are not going to hold our event uh, in person next year. Uh, and now here we are at the virtual version of Folk Alliance. So really, you frame our, our first question beautifully. So talk a little bit about how you came to make that decision so early and then what the process has been of getting us here to where we are today. And particularly in mind of the folk community and Folk Alliance, like uh, many of our communities, but you know, uniquely too, being such so much about intimacy and personal connection and physical proximity, really. Well, I mean, I think we were all uh, taking it seriously from, from the beginning. Um, we made an early call in part um, based on the in-person composition of our conference and the reality that um, financially, uh, without people coming from outside of the US, which makes up a, a large part of the delegate base, we were going to run into um, a financial um, critical loss scenario. And then just looking at the immediate impact for all of the artists and their teams. I mean, it's not just the artists who've lost income, it's everyone who works with them who is impacted by the lack of revenue. Um, and it, it didn't take long to do the math and realize that it would be tone deaf to be selling registrations for an event in February to a community that was immediately um, hit by financial constraints and crisis. So um, it, 
we we could have proceeded. Um, we would have lost money. We'll lose money this year um, anyway. But given the option to produce something that ultimately, even in a best case scenario, was going to have dented attendance, um, and in a worst case scenario, would have been pulled out from under us had we proceeded with a live event, um, we opted to make an early call and um, figure out how to uh, move online. Um, we had the, the benefit of seeing our, our peers, and I you know, congratulate um, Paul, Shanta, Jed, and, and, and Patty, and, and all of the, the teams that have um, mounted online events. We certainly learned from, from that, and um, hopefully you know, some of the things that you see here uh, at Folk Unlocked um, share and, and show some of the collective learning. And ultimately, in the end, we're, we're all in this in different organizations representing different communities. There's plenty of overlap, but um, we're also as leaders and organizations um, learning and, and sharing. And this is, I think the, the silver lining is that there are many things that we'll be able to carry back into uh, our in-person events that will expand access for folks who, who can't afford to attend or who wouldn't otherwise attend if they had to um, arrive in person at an event. Well, events are, are the face of all of our organizations. Uh, the body, heart and soul of these organizations is supporting musicians, supporting uh, the art worlds that surround and support the musicians and uh, feeding, feeding the, the community of fans who make all of this possible. Each of you has a, an aspect to your organization that is about relief, that is about support, that is about um, helping musicians navigate a time when their incomes have been cut off, when they face incredible health risks in, in every situation, but especially Shanta and yours, uh, when they can't cross borders. Um, so I'm going to throw this out to the room. Uh, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, recognizing musicians as workers and, uh, and how you are serving that need. Anyone can jump in. Well, I guess I'll start. Um, I, I know that uh, like, like the rest of, of these great leaders, you know, we all had to sort of figure out how do we respond quickly. We're fortunate at the IBMA that we've had a bluegrass trust fund uh, in place since 1987 for medical emergencies, other financial emergencies. And we moved quickly to create a COVID account uh, and have and use that to help uh, our community. We also created a resource page uh, so that we could help those in our community who were also um, having some you know, difficulty and needed answers in, in the community as well. Um, so th that was our response, at least initially, to get out there, and it's an ongoing effort. Patty, I know your community, um, there are a lot of older musicians, and also, um, as COVID has shown us, it has exposed so many inequities. No, not exposed. It has thrown to the into the light inequities we already knew were there. So, talk a little bit about serving uh, the the blues world, which you know has particular is in a particular position. Sure, I think like um, everyone on the panel, we tried to move very quickly to respond to the pandemic. We established our COVID nineteen blues musicians relief fund, and I'm very grateful that the blues community is a generous one. We have raised over $300,000 with that and have used that to pay mortgages, uh, utility bills, car notes, to meet the uh, real uh, everyday needs uh, of musicians as they try to sustain their livelihoods, even as they have not been able to um, play in venues, all the venues being shut down. What we have found in um, getting to the point that you alluded to is that there are um, musicians within the blues community that are really challenged even to participate and access our COVID relief fund. Uh, so we have to meet them where they are. If you are dealing with um, an older black musician who is still using a flip phone 
and your program is geared to um, someone using uh, computer access uh, to your application, that's not going to work. So how do we address that? And we have been um, challenged, uh, but I think we have risen to that challenge of really being mindful and just very humane in trying to um, find ways that we can bridge that gap or close that digital divide. So if it is necessary, we will um, take um, an application over the phone. If it is necessary and it has been necessary, we will um, use our own phones to take um, images of their bills and their receipts. Those are the kinds of things that you have to do to make a program real and impactful. Uh, if you adhere to um, just a strict idea that everyone's going to turn on their computer and click a button and fill out your form, uh, you're not going to meet those people who really, really need your services. So that's been one of the core lessons um, that we've learned, but it, I think, also just reflects our approach to our work. Um, and again, underscoring the fact that um, this is a human process and you can't be locked into a process, uh, a mechanized process. Anta, I'm interested in um, in the Global Fest community uh, and how how you're confronting the issues that already existed about restricted travel um, and particularly in the US uh, for international musicians. This has been amplified exponentially by the pandemic. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I think we're already, Global Fest was started it, right after 9-11. Um, as a concept and really um, because of the closing of borders and understanding how much more challenging it would be to incentivize touring from other parts of the world and yet why it is so much even more important in these moments to really focus on how do we uh, bring in this culture from around the world into the center of our conversations in America. Um, so I think we'll continue to hold that flame. Um, we have always focused on how to really highlight artists that are coming from a part of the world that is particularly at the margin. So Haitian communities, we have featured multiple years. Uh, we have always featured New Orleans artists as um, within our own country um, after Hurricane Katrina. And so we'll continue to do that. And our belief is that as these artists tour, of course, they're they're bringing money not only into their own bank accounts, which is so necessary, but they're also bringing money and um, a shining a spotlight into the culture of their community and hopefully bringing actual resource into those communities. So we do have a, a relief fund that's just getting launched, uh, was just launched in January. And uh, we're hopeful to get some small grants out to our artists, manager, uh, agent communities too that support all of these artists and this this field as, as a whole. Angus, you have a, a new fund, a new initiative for Folk Alliance called the Village Fund, which I know directly addresses what we're talking about right now. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is new and, and we're um, not late to the game. Things come um, as they can when they're when they're meant to, but certainly having such a fund five years ago would have been a benefit to the community. Five years from now, it will be a benefit for different reasons. Um, but there's always there's always financial need in in different ways. So the village fund um, we've just launched in terms of fundraising, and as of uh, April, we will start to accept applications for uh, grants, five hundred dollar grants for folk artists um, and industry entrepreneurs. So anyone who works within the, the folk music community, be they um, agents, managers, publicists, um, production crew, anyone who is experiencing financial hardship, who is either a member of the organization or has participated in, in the last three years. Uh, and again, realizing that there were uh, lots of funds available, we started to look at some of the, the gaps in those funds and the fact that there was continued need. Um, and that just in terms of 
communicating. Um, I think each of our organizations have uh, different communities. There is overlap, but there are also different um, ways of generating interest um, from, from fans. So one of the things that we keep thinking about are that the folks who go to the or went to the clubs and will go again and sit in festival fields and listen online or at home on uh, records or or uh, on the radio who are the fans of the genres who might not donate to our organizations in terms of our own fundraising and survival but who can support the artists and the ecology of um, the, the community that brings the music to them. Uh, and, and that led to the, the Village Fund. Beautiful. Uh, I wish we had a whole other hour so we could talk about this uh, this beautiful metaphor of the ecology of, of music communities. Um, but I know the rest of this conference is addressing that very specifically. And so I'll be in the other sessions uh, learning about that. Um, Jed, I want to turn the conversation a little bit. I know Americana has uh, has also uh, been providing relief efforts, and, and feel free to tell us about that too. But we want to uh, have our last uh, part of this conversation be a little more personal. Talk about how the this year has changed each of you as leaders, as music lovers, as as uh, key key players in these communities. Um, and Jed, I know what a deeply self-reflective person you are. I've had many conversations with you about this. So um, I hope you will share how you have been rethinking the definition of America and maybe how Americana and America <laughs> and, uh, and tell us about how that's influencing your work now. Yeah. I, I you know, this happens. Uh, the time for self-reflection sort of I, probably for all of us, every year I go through, um, every year I'm humbled uh, by the participation um, uh, of the community gathering um, uh, that we do that's called Americana Fest. Uh, we didn't have that uh, this year. So that was kind of a hard thing to let, to let go of. Um, my admiration um, for the creative artist only, only grew in part for longing because uh, longing to uh, to be part of a live music environment again, um, to me, live music is you know that's what gets my endorphins going. That's 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 a, a spellbinding experience that that we all go through for discovery. Um, you know, it's just been a really uh, intense year. I'm really proud uh, to be part of a community. Um, through the passion, I believe, of the artists that we love. Uh, that's why we we made it uh, through this year. And that's why I'm committed to continue to do what I do. And that's why we're going to make it through this crazy time uh, this year and beyond. Paul, as you, uh, as you leave your post, I wonder if you have any thoughts on how this year has transformed you. Oh my gosh, I, I think it's deeply impacted all of us so deep, you know, so much. It's 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 hard to even describe. But I, I would say, in a few ways, for me personally, um, beyond simply what we've seen in this country and and what's going on there, which uh, I'm sure has 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 changed all of us in some way uh, for sure. Um, I, from a musical standpoint, from a, from a music community standpoint. What I've seen is resilience. You know, you typically move along, inch along in, in the evolution of what you do as a community, both in terms of the business side of it, as well as how you interact with others within your community. This, this moment with the pandemic has had the entire community sit back, try to figure out what to do. It's, it's no longer okay just to inch along. We have to address technological issues, access issues, uh, involvement, equity issues. Um, and they're, they are forefront. They are things that we can't just inch along. And, and, and moments like the, these, while they're challenging, there's opportunity that comes out of it. And we've learned how to do business. We've learned how to connect with people in new ways uh, that might have been uncomfortable in the past, and now they're becoming more comfortable. So I think that 
is something I've witnessed. It's, it's changed me a bit. And I think I've seen a lot of people change in that way. You know, I'm grateful that we have a, a DEI uh, task force. Uh, Michelle Concession uh, chairs that and um, making some big changes in, in our community that are, that are needed as well. So they're, they're just multifaceted ways. Patty, you made a, a major life change during this uh, this pandemic and uh, and both a, a geographical change. Uh, you were in the Northeast, now you're in the South. Uh, you were at a museum, now you're at a music organization. Share a little bit of this journey with us. Um, it's been an amazing journey and I'm very grateful to have discovered a community in Memphis, but also a blues community that's very welcoming and warm. Uh, it's made my transition not only easier, but really um, very fulfilling. Um, I have those moments where I reflect and say how blessed and lucky I am to do the work that I do. But even as I say that, um, I realize that uh, while I consider myself a veteran in nonprofit management, um, dealing with cultural organizations, there are always new frontiers, there are always new challenges, and I think we've all reflected today on the fact that we've had to be nimble, we've had to learn new things. And so this has been a year of learning and adjustment, uh, and I think that's what makes the job interesting. That's what makes uh, the job um, really engaging and challenging, that um, we're, yes, um, we have tried and true skill sets, but we're stretching as well. So uh, for me, that's been very fulfilling. Shanta, New York City was hit hard early in the pandemic and uh, and now again has been going through uh, a surge. So uh, I'm curious uh, how your experience in the pandemic has influenced your work and, uh, and you work beyond just Global Fest, you work in public programs in New York, the most vibrant city in the world, in my opinion. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, constantly learning. I think one thing I learned early on was how much I do actually like to be in control. <laughs> and so having that uh, taken away was a, was a big learning. And, uh, and it's, I think what it has done for me is really remind me that uh, the community is where our strength is. Um, finding this connection with people across not just who we are, but what we believe in um, and the power of the arts to really shift what is happening in our world, in our minds, in our hearts. You know, I, I feel like I'm becoming um, a little bit more dippy in my <laughs> approach, but I really feel this necessity to be joy centered and um, artist centered. And I think the thing that I've missed the most is and recognize the most about myself, which I, I think before I would have placed myself very squarely in administration, curation um, on that side. And now I'm really placing myself as an audience member and thinking about uh, the world in that way and how I intersect with the audience that I'm asking to come to my venue, to my Zoom room, um, and, and how necessary that experience is for each audience member to have a connection to the artists on stage. And, um, and I, I'm hopeful that that will make for much richer experiences in the future. And I can't, I cannot wait to be an audience member in the very near future. Me, I feel exactly the same way. <laughs> Angus, we'll end, we'll, we'll, we'll end with you. I think, you know, I have to say, uh, Folk Alliance was my last uh, big in-person event before everything changed. And, and I often have said to people that that is the reason I've been able to make it through <laughs> because it's so inspiring. And, and the folk world is so inspiring to me uh, the the connection, resilience, and, and mutual aid of the folk world. So I wonder, um, I just I just wonder how you've seen those qualities reflected as you've continued to lead Folk Alliance this year. Well, um, it's Folk Alliance, not Music Alliance, and I always think about that. Like, what is what is the significance of the word beyond the sound of the the music? Because it's actually 
as the music of the people, it's it's all the musics. And it, I don't mean that that's the overarching genre. I mean, it sort of comes up inside, you know, the blues is folk, it's all folk music. So I think um, within that as an organization and from a leadership perspective, um, we don't, there are values and ideals at the center of that, um, but it doesn't give us a pass. And I think that you know the the work of the past few years and um, the issues of this past year have really driven home for me and for us the need to continue that really rigorous examination of our organization, our genre, and to invite and challenge the community and ourselves, myself included, to to really. Um, look at the, the the ways that issues of um, racism and marginalization exist within the norms that that we operate in, present through. Um, and for me, as as a leader, it's meant um, you know I I always felt like I had to as the leader you had to dream it up and do it and gen and and ultimately. Um, sitting still, being literally in this room since March 13th, um, letting go and letting other people author more things has been the, the greatest lesson. Um, literally, the name of this conference, Folk Unlocked, came from the staff in meetings without me there. So stepping out to do other things and connect the dots and, and have peer-level conversations um, has is important work too and not always authoring things, literally letting the community run with things. You know, one of the biggest mistakes I made as well-intentioned as the programming has been at times was trying to, um, you know, worrying about controlling um, the conversation and not having it be too awkward too soon and trying to get the community to a place. And, and now understanding that this is, um, yeah, it, it's it's time to let those conversations happen and that it's does a disservice as a leader to try and author or manage um, what pops up in those conversations. Uh, a big thank you to Ann Powers and to our esteemed panelists, Angus, Patricia, Paul, Shanta and Jed. This, je this session will continue to be available as a recording on the Folk Unlocked platform all week. Please take a moment to provide feedback about today's conversation by posting comments in the chat. Finally, Folk Unlocked is made available at a pay what you can price point, thanks to the generosity of our donors. If you'd like to support our work, donations can be made at folk.org donate. Stay safe, stay connected community, and we'll see you soon.